Okay, welcome everyone to this uh, second session in the European Strand, uh, UK RIP. My name is Justine Bryan. I work for the Institute of Ideas uh, and I'm the national coordinator of the Debating Matters competition, the sixth form debating competition that the Institute runs. A year or so ago, as part of my role with Debating Matters, uh, I was in the process of writing this topic guide. We give these to our students for all the debates we do on the issue of Scottish independence uh, in the light of the SNP's surprise majority, vi majority victory last year uh, in the Scottish parliamentary elections. And the fact that for the first time in a generation, certainly uh, uh, preceding my lifetime, uh, the possibility of an independent Scotland was on the cards again. Now the motion we put before the sixth form debaters was, we should maintain the union. And it was my suggestion to do that debate motion as is a subject I'm personally interested in, it's why I'm producing and sharing this session now. But as I wrote this topic guide resource, two things struck me. The first was how disinterested people around me seemed to be about what I saw was the potential balkanisation of Britain. And the second was a real dearth of positive arguments for maintaining the union. There were lots of very dull practical arguments about what uh, a post uh, union Britain might look like but there were, there were really no kind of positive cases made about why the union should be maintained and I thought that was extremely interesting. Now, since this topic guide was published last year obviously the issue of Scottish independence has rarely been out of the news increasingly so in the last few weeks uh, in the run-up to the signing by the Prime Minister and First Minister of the referendum agreement on Monday this week. But while current polls suggest that most Scots aren't currently keen on independence, the question of the UK fragmenting, I think, is a real one, uh, and one that we shouldn't avoid, either because we think it's boring or it won't happen. And an awful lot, I suspect, could change between now and 2014, when the referendum in Scotland actually takes place. But as I just said, much of the contemporary discussion about Scottish independence really focuses on practical issues about economy, about distribution of oil, wealth, about military matters... But it, it occurs to me that there's surely a greater issue at stake here, a point of principle we should either want to defend or explain why the union has had its time. And it seems to me that that's missing from the contemporary discussion. So what, for example, does the debate about Scottish independence tell us about British nationhood today? Is the UK still a tenable political entity? Or was the creation of the union in 1707 a positive outcome of its time, but really something that needs to be looked at again and we need to rethink anew about what the UK might look like? And whilst SNP leader Alex Salmon often talks about establishing an independent nation within the European Union, although interestingly in the last couple of years with the EU crisis, it's notable how little Europe is spoken of uh, from the nationalist point of view. Is it even meaningful to talk of independence within the EU uh, where laws are created and enacted outside of national governments and national interests? So even within a European context, what would that mean for an independent Scotland? My question to our speakers today and to you as the audience is, is the nation that was created not at the end of a bayonet, so eloquently put by a commentator, uh, as so many states of the same period were, but created through uh, shared purposes and beliefs, uh, a product, if you like, of Enlightenment thinking, which recognised economic and political values two countries had in common, England and Scotland. Is that not worth maintaining and arguing for? Or is the future of the British Isles as we know it today really one of federalism and competing nationalisms? Is that what the future looks like post-2014? There are lots and lots of other practical questions could be looked at in this issue, but I hope you see that from, from my very brief outline about what the session will be looking at, this discussion is more, I hope it will be more, than a straightforward for or against independence. There are lots of these discussions happening, and what we're trying to do with this session is take that a little bit further and think, I suppose, about nationhood in Britain and what kind of society we might want to live in. And that's why we have invited the guests we have, not because they necessarily represent mainstream political sides. None of them represent the yes or the opposing better together campaigns because they're interesting people in their own rights. I hope with interesting thoughts and ideas on this discussion, they might give us all some food for thought on this particular debate. So sitting on my right, we have Craig Fernington. He's the online resources manager and my colleague at the Institute of Ideas. I first met Craig through uh, the Debating Matters competition. He was a former competitor. Uh, and you might like to know he is now Iranian TV's go-to guy for all things Scottish. Uh, and he was last seen being interviewed outside our local pub. So that's uh, one of Craig's many claims to fame. Uh, Iranian TV loves him. Really improved his image in Iraq. 
<laughs> he's hoping that if things go wrong, he's got friends in Iran. I think that's what's happening. <laughs> Next to me, on my immediate left, we have Joyce McMillan. Joyce is chair of the Hansard Society Working Group in, in Scotland. Uh, she's a judge at the 2010 Saltaire Scottish Book of the Year Award. She's a very well-known theatre critic for the Scotsman newspaper, and she's been a renowned political and arts columnist and broadcaster for the last 25 years. I'm very glad she agreed to speak. She's just rushed here from a, another debate, so thank you very much to Joyce. And last but by no means least, uh, on my far left, not politically, we have <laughs> Max Wynne Cowie, who is head of the Progressive Conservatism Project at Demos. He's the author of a really, really interesting book uh, Demos published called A Place of Pride, which was on the readings for the session, and also Are We There Yet?, a collection on race and conservatism, also by Demos. He's also one of the most intelligent and engaging conservatives I I've ever met, uh, which is something when I was a kind of youthful anti-Tory I never imagined I'd say. It's not as much of a compliment as it sounds, I think, when from no, the No, it's, it's a huge compliment, honestly. So, uh, uh, and so far we haven't fallen out about anything. So uh, very, very pleased that Max is here as well. Max has also just rushed from another debate, so thank you to both of you. Now let me just give you a bit of background about this session. It's slightly less than an hour long now. It's an in-conversation, so the speakers are not going to present formal speeches. We're going to have a conversation conversation up here on the panel. Uh, uh, I'm going to try and encourage the panellists to argue amongst themselves or, or, or take each other's ideas up and then we'll come out to you, the audience. I'm curious to know what the speakers think about the prospect of uh, Scotland breaking away from the Union of an Independent Scotland and Max, I'm going to pick on you first. I'm still mourning the loss of Southern Ireland from the Union and so to a certain extent I think my view of whether Scotland should leave the Union is pretty clear but I know that I uh, am not all on my own able or entitled to decide whether Scotland leaves the Union and whether or not the country that I was born and brought up in ceases to exist. But what I'm really certain of is that neither are Scottish people. They're not entitled on their own to decide that this Union ceases to exist. Uh, they're not a colony. Um, this is not a, an independent struggle against an evil overarching empire, you made the crucial point in all of this at the start. You know, this is not a, a country that's been forged at the end of a bayonet. It's a country that was, grew out of shared aspirations, shared ideas, a shared monarch. I would argue we still have most of those things, but I would also argue that if we decide that we're not going to be a country anymore, that's a decision for the country, not for one small section of it. OK. Uh, a similar point was made by David Mitchell, actually, in The Times a few years ago. He made a very similar mm. point that this wasn't just up to the Scots. Craig? Actually, while, while I am Scottish, I, I, I do live in England now, I, and as such, I, I wouldn't get a vote. Um, Salmond, uh, quite, quite rightly, in my opinion, kind of says, you know, the vote uh, for Scottish independence should be made by those who live there. I'm not sure if I quite agree with Matt. I think while the debate must be had between the entire of the nation, I do kind of think that ultimately, um, if Scotland wants to leave, the only people that can make that decision and the only people we can listen to are the people of Scotland and, and how they vote. Uh, for me, it would be a very bad thing. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't like it at all. I mean, I, I live in uh, England, but I, I live in the UK. I don't feel like I, I live abroad. So while I'm negative about the prospect, I, I do definitely think that uh, the only way for this decision to be made when it comes down to it, when it comes down to the ballot, um, is uh, in Scotland. Okay. Joyce, what, what's your thought on this, Borden? On the question of who should decide, I think there are, there's both an argument of principle and an argument, a uh, very overwhelming practical argument, as to why um, this is a matter for the Scots. Um, first of all, we raised the question. Um, but that's, that's about the board. But the se secondly, in international law, peoples do have a right to self-determination. And although the Scots are not at the moment a sovereign state, they're certainly a nation and are recognised as such in the multinational structure of the UK. So if the Scots decide within themselves to, to, to take themselves off, you know, then just uh, in international law they have a right to do that. There are people and they can do that. But the overwhelming argument anyway, whatever the technicalities of the law are, are to th think about the practical politics of it. If you had a great UK-wide debate on whether the UK should split up and everybody in England voted for it not to split up, and everybody in Scotland voted for it to split up. Yeah, what would be the consequence of that? You know, you can't actually force a country to stay in, in membership of another country by sheer majority voting if a majority of the people within that area are actually not in agreement. So practically speaking, it doesn't really matter. Um, so, so in that day, you know, it doesn't really matter if, if everyone in the rest of the UK said they didn't want Scotland to go, but Scots were still passionate about going, then, then you know, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be practical to try and 
make them stay. However, in terms of what's likely to happen in 2014, the overwhelming poll evidence is that the Scots are not ready to go. The current polls stand at about 58% in favour of the Union and 30% in favour of independence. So Alex Salmond and his party have a very, very steep hill to climb in order to change that. They could change it. it. It depends greatly on what happens in UK politics over that period. It depends on the economy. But I think the chances of the SNP winning an outright yes in that referendum have to be classed as pretty low. OK. But Joyce, I mean, quickly, uh, did you, uh, do you want to see the union maintained? Are you not bothered if Scott's going alone? Um, my, my, well, I'm actually now a kind of undecided on this mm. in the sense that I think you raised the right question right at the start, which the question about the United Kingdom is what is it for? It was perfectly obvious what it was for in 1707. It was, it was for uh, building an empire, allowing the Scots into the trading opportunities of that empire and stopping, kind of, you know, destroying the Scots when they tried to do any independent um, colonial activities on their own. So it was about the Scots getting the opportunities that came with um, becoming part of the English, the, the growing English empire. And it was also about a kind of gut-level agreement on the level of kind of faith and society, or what we would now think of as, as kind of the politics of religion, which was that both countries, by very different processes, had become Protestant and saw themselves, therefore, as being more advanced, uh, more interested in freedom, more egalitarian than the, the still Catholic and, and predominantly sort of very heavily imperial and monarchical regimes on the continent. So this, the, the, the British conceived of themselves and built up an idea of themselves in the 18th century as the advocates of freedom um, on the edge of on, on the, the, the northwestern corner of Europe with something to tell the rest of the continent, if you like, about sort of civic freedom and opportunity and so on. Although, of course, all of that was built um, on the back of the huge imperial success of this alliance between Scotland and England because the Scots, thanks to their particular kind of Protestant revolution, were an exceptionally well-educated people by European standards at that time. Almost all of them could read and write. So a ganging Scot, as we call it, a, a Scot, an, an enterprising Scot who went out into the British Empire with those literacy skills and so on, was very likely to do well and to bring quite a lot of wealth back. And you just need to drive along the Great Western Road in Glasgow and see the extent of the, the, the trading and, and, and political and military success of that. So it was clear what it was all about in 1707. It was clear what it was all about in 1939 and 1945. But since the Thatcherite revolution of the 1980s, it has been much less clear to most Scots what it is all about. And that's the crisis that we currently face. Whether the great Olympic um, orgasm, as it were, um, has helped Scots to, to develop a, an idea of, of a 21st century United Kingdom that might be worth staying in um, is a question. It was certainly a very impressive display of a modern multicultural society. But that's the question that we're stuck with now. We know what it was for then. We know what it was for in 1945. What is it for now? And if the UK can't give a good answer to that question, then it will always be vulnerable to break up. I, I, sus say. I suspect, Max, you look like you're keen to come back on that. Well, no, I mean, I, I, think, I think there's... A to be fair, I think there's a lot of truth to that. The really depressing thing about the Better Together campaign thus far has been that it isn't really about purpose at yeah. all. National purpose is important. You want to keep yeah. a group of people together. You want to keep a sense of momentum. Yeah. But what on earth would we be persuading Scottish people that we're hurtling towards? And I think that's a fair point. But I do wonder, I mean, I, I blame the European Union for the success of the SNP over the last 30 years. I think that the umbrella of... Europeanisation has allowed all kinds of kind of oddball nationalist movements to emerge and to be reasonably successful. And I do wonder whether there is whether you would see any potential reigniting of national purpose for a united kingdom in the event, as seems more and more likely, that some of the machinery of the European Union begins to fall apart. I mean, as uh, Justine was saying, you know. It's interesting that none of these nationalist movements any longer have the, as their absolute kind of core message the idea that we will be yep. Catalonia in Europe or Scotland in Europe. Or, mm -hmm. And it ignites a whole set of conversations about sterling and about euros, etc. Those are boring conversations, right? Those are boring conversations. But if, as seems likely, at the same time that Scotland is having the debate about whether or not they want to remain inside the United Kingdom, in Westminster we're having a debate about an even more, I would argue, kind of fundamental question in terms of the future, which is whether or not we're prepared to remain within the kind of uh, increased bureaucratic totalitarianism of the European Union. Is there not the chance that exit for the UK could provide renewed purpose for the UK and renewed purpose in staying together? I think, Sorry, yeah. Actually, I think, I think that's quite interesting in that 
for the SNP, often the current Westminster government's position of kind of an anti-EU is actually fodder for them. They see, they see it as a very negative thing. Uh, uh, and I tried to call um, uh, uh, the future UK outside of the EU isolated, uh, and out of, which for me, it creates a kind of very confused sense of what an independent country would be. A Scotland in, in the EU, we just have to look at Greece uh, or any other number of countries to see uh, how little power uh, they have when Brussels decides uh, things need to change within their country. So for, for me, that's, that's uh, always a very confusing point. I think in terms of what the UK is for, I think it's a very kind of abstract concept. And I think I agree with Joyce's uh, general points, but I think if, if in colonial times, if you ask what is the UK for, that you know, the, the solutions uh, Joyce gave are very uh, retroactive uh, perspective on, on situations, but also so true. For me, one of the big things that is kind of uh, helping fracture the UK is actually a uh, loss of political purpose of the national parties. So the Tories have given up on Scotland, uh, despite the fact uh, within uh, people's lifetimes they were the biggest party in Scotland. They, uh, uh, people seem to forget that. So the Thatcher Revolution obviously changed a lot, but it wasn't the only thing that ever happened in history. Uh, even Labour, they fra helped fracture the party in, in the 80s during the Thatcher Revolution by helping push for devolution. And they wanted to do that to uh, help uh, get votes for them in, in, in the Westminster government. But it led to them having a weaker base there, when they, which the SNP could uh, force their way into. The Lib Dems, I, I guess, that we can kind of forget about now. For me, uh, uh, one of the ways you would find renewed purpose in the UK is if we had a party or a, a political movement which felt it had a united common cause. I think that's what's missing, and I think that's why um, SNP starts to look uh, like a good idea, because, you know, well, why not? What else is going on? Yeah, now, I mean, there, certainly in Scotland there's a sense that the SNP are the only political party that are sort of functioning as a political party. I mean, yesterday, for instance, I don't know if there's been much about this in, in, in the media down here, but they had a terrific debate at the SNP conference in Perth about, about whether uh, an independent Scotland should be in NATO or not. And they reversed, you know, two generations of SNP policy by deciding that it should, under pressure from the leadership. Alex Salmond have been keen for them to make that change and their current defence spokesperson. But that kind of open debate where the leadership genuinely, I think, did not know how that debate was going to go on the floor of the conference at Perth yesterday. And a Packed conference, you know, the kind of size of confidence, a conference of, of real sort of grassroots activists that, that political parties struggle to get now, you know, rather than just conferences full of lobbyists and so on, is, is something that, that kind of demonstrates the strength of the SNP as a political movement. It's got a progressive project for Scotland. It says, whether it's true or not, but nonetheless it aspires to have an independent Scotland which is fairer, greener and more prosperous than the current Scotland. And those are the things that it thinks it can achieve. No, don't sigh, Max. I mean, any sensible party Which party? Say yeah, that. well, exactly. Yeah. Which party is it yeah. that doesn't say no. they want a fairer, greener or more prosperous? I mean, no, that, but, that's no, not but, a political project. No but, no, but, no, but it is a political project if, if, if it has the kind of substance that particularly the sustainability argument has in Scotland, which could easily be the kind of re renewable energy sort of capital of the planet, really, and, and independent experts have said that, given the amount of wind and wave and so on that is around. So, so there is a kind of project there where people can sort of get an idea of a possible future that looks a little bit better than the present. And at the moment, um, I think it's absolutely right that none of the UK parties are in a very clear way offering that. You know, the kind of future that the Tory party um, um, wants in terms of sort of breakdown of the state and all that is just not of interest to Scotland. Nor is it true. Um, you know, the kind of future that the Labour Party is groping towards just doesn't seem very inspiring and, as you say, has less residence in Scotland than it used to have. So, you know, it, it, there is this, this kind of dangerous situation for unionists, which is that the SNP is really the only game in town. Okay. I mean, I do think... And the only one that looks positive. But I, I, I think well, yeah. that's also... Uh, because the SNP have the vision of an, uh, an independent Scotland. And for me, that's the only kind of thing that they yeah. have. So, so they, they want to be uh, everything to everyone. So while, while you're right, uh, they, they, they've gone about sustainably uh, in Greens, they also want uh, to boost, uh, uh, use the money from oil production. Uh, in the past, they wanted to uh, be a banking centre before uh, the crash made that <laughs> appear a bit <laughs> daft. That's true. Uh, then they wanted, uh, at one point, they wanted to uh, uh, be, be like the... Uh, the, the, another Celtic tiger like Ireland, and now they want to kind of get in with the Scandinavians. I mean, that's the thing. It's just to, uh, what, what the SNP promised to people that the other parties don't is, well, stuff will change. Things might change. 
and that kind of has an appeal. And I, I don't think it's actually much, much beyond that. Well, I think, yeah, I think that's right. I would reject the idea that they, what they have is a coherent vision. And I think your example of the, the debate about NATO membership mm. kind of highlights that. You know, the SNP has been a broad church to almost farcical proportions in terms of what it's included. They do have the virtue of a project. Yes. A single project that, that Craig's talking about, you know, a mm. single project of, well, this is what we aspire to and we're, gonna, we're going to, to, to found an independent Scotland. And whether or not people agree with that, and I think the disparity in the polling between the kind of monumental success of the SNP electorally and what people are telling yeah. us that they want yeah. in terms of the future of their nation does show, you're absolutely right, that having a project, having a purpose is in and of itself quite attractive and seductive. It's also bloody dangerous in some ways, but, you know, leaving that aside, at least it's something. And I think that's kind of the, the point you're both trying to make. But, I mean, the responsibility for that, and I think this is where we're possibly all in almost violent agreement, <laughs> the responsibility for that does lie with the uh, union parties and their seeming inability to talk about a national future in a way that even mimics a, a tiny proportion of the purpose that the SNP is able to project. And, and I think that is very worrying. I mean, I, I, it's interesting, you know, you said about the, the Tory project to, I can't remember whether it was dismantle or destroy, but it began with a D, the, the state. And, you know, I mean, that's bollocks, isn't it? I mean, that's just not what the Conservative Party's project is. It's just not what the Conservative Party talks about or is doing. But I completely understand that it's been, there's been a very successful mission to so toxify the Conservative Party, and so so toxify, I think we're supposed to call them Tories if we're talking about Scotland, isn't it? I've never actually heard a, a Scottish person refer to people as a Conservative, but uh, only as Tories. Um, and that's been hugely successful. And my uh, kind of worry there, though, is that, uh, say Scotland achieves its, its, its independent ambitions, for whatever reason, I don't know, half the electorate doesn't get out of bed on the morning of the referendum, and only the, the cranks do, and, you know, you've got an independent Scotland. I mean, the SNP as a political movement, surely dies that day. Because not only does it lose the purpose that you're all ascribing to it, but suddenly they've got to govern a country. And they've got to govern a country in a way that, uh, that balances the tensions between their very neoliberal wings that Craig was alluding to, no, Matt, and the kind of mad green people Matt, on the other side. No, no, you're really making a bad mistake of underestimating the opposition there. I mean, the, the SNP has been quite a successful mm. national administration in Scotland since 2007 mm. on almost every, and I'm sure if you talk to Conservative ministers who have dealt with them, they would agree yeah. on almost every possible um, you know, area. They score a higher level of competence than the previous Liberal Labour um, regime in Scotland. Um, they do have a bit of a vision for the future of Scotland. It may not be great, it may not be, be fleshed out in detail, but it, but it has at least as much credibility as any future vision that any, as any of the other parties have. And it has been unopposed either by any coherent talk about um, the constitution um, from the other parties or about a, pro a you know, kind of social project for the UK and for Scotland as part of the UK that sounds as attractive. So there really is a problem. They're not very good, but they're outperforming all the others. That's and that's true. just the fact of the matter. And as for the Tories, by the way, they are self-toxifying in Scotland. I mean, I can't begin to explain okay. to you how much the whole stance of the Tory party since the 1980s has been regarded let as just, silly and irrelevant by 90% of Scots. Well, and by plenty of, plenty of people not in Scotland. I mean, I'd have to concede that point, really, right. but yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, I think I, I agree with Joyce. The, the point is that the SNP are competent, scarily competent compared to some of the other people in Scotland, but that's not really, really saying much. I mean, I think, would, would I trust Salmon to uh, run a government? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. But I think, actually, the, I think Max's point about the structure of the SNP kind of falling apart, I think, is probably true. And I think we saw that yesterday in the NATO discussion, that there are lots of people in the SNP who are along for the ride as long as Salmond can get them independence. After that, uh, you know, Before, game on. The one thing I think you all agree on is some needing some sense of national purpose yep. to, to remain coherent. Otherwise, things like nationalist movements have a disproportionate uh, impact on the population and are more powerful than they should be. That, for me, that's always been the nub of the debate. And when we were writing the topic guide, it was the thing I was struggling with most, which was kind of coherent arguments about what the purpose of union is today. So we can critique nationalist parties or nationalist movements, we can talk about history and we can talk about shared uh, uh, history and reasons for being together, but what would the national purpose of the UK be today, especially 
in a Europe, and I don't mean even within the European <coughs> Union context, but within a Europe that appears to be fragmenting into smaller and smaller national interest groups. What's unique about the UK that means we're not going to go down a federalist nationalist route? Max? Joyce talked about moments in history when union has meant a lot. Um, you mentioned 1939, 1914, and those stretching all the way back to 77. I think the point about moments in history is that, and, and I realise this sounds like an avoidance of the question, and I don't mean it to, but the point about moments where we are suddenly grateful and understand what it is that the union is for is that you can't necessarily predict when the next one is going to come along. Yeah. And I think there's a strong argument to be made, actually, about the robustness that union has lent us as a people, the robustness against political extremes, the robustness against forced stripping out of our sovereignty and our kind of our ability to decide on our own fate and our own destiny. That robustness has not come from some idea, some illusory idea that, that we are immune to such things. It, it's come from both the, the sameness that brought us into union and the differences between us, right? So um, when we talk about Thatcher, the great tragedy of, and it's not the only moment in history, I would absolutely agree, but the great tragedy of, the, of what... what <laughs> Thatcherism and the legacy of Thatcherism has done in this country is that I do think that it has, it was a moment where many people in Scotland, many people in Wales felt that they suddenly were unable to modify mm -hmm. and to correct exactly right. some of the political trajectory that we English people are prone to take. Thatcherism, whatever you think of it, was a form of political extremism mm. and it to some extent undermine the purpose of union, because the purpose of union has to be paradoxical. So it has to be that we are alike enough and the same enough, that we have shared values and purposes, but also that we're different enough to save each other from mistakes. Mm -hmm. And it is a tragedy. It's a tragedy that that kind of understanding was, 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 was eroded and degraded in that way. Yeah, I, well, it, it certainly was, and, and the point was that, you see, seen from a Scottish point of view, it was a deal-breaker. I, uh, I have in my house a thing that my father was given, really, as a, as, a, as a British RAF serviceman in the desert at the end of the Second World War, when they were all sitting around having troops' parliaments because there wasn't much else to do. And they had these forces' parliaments, the tenor of them was very left-wing. I mean, the, the country was in alliance with Russia, all the rest of it. There was a lot of uh, leading communist intellectuals were involved, all the rest of it. So, you know, the, 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 the tone was left-wing, and the, the conversations in those troops' parliaments were probably partly responsible for the huge Labour victory in the 1945 election. But the boot on which their kind of civics lessons and discussions were based was called The British Way and Purpose. Mm. And The British Way and Purpose was about democracy, equality, and the promise of a welfare state. That's what it was about. And, you know, you can argue about how realistic that was, blah, blah, but, but that was what was being told to these people at this crisis moment when they were putting their lives on the line for the nation. And people like my father came back voted Labour, got what they voted for, this, despite coming from humble backgrounds, opportunities for their children, free university education, never have to worry about paying for a doctor again, all of that, that was the deal. And this woman from Grantham stands up and says that the deal's off. Okay. That, that is the story of what's happened to the Tories in Scotland in a single sentence. Craig, what might cohere us in the future? What is the thing that might United as a nation. Uh, I think actually a lot of the steps we've already taken uh, make trying to create a coherent um, uh, project again uh, very difficult. Mm. Devolution, mm. Uh, some people thought uh, would kill independence, it... um, but it ha I mean it quite clearly hasn't. And actually, uh, what we have now is people who purportedly uh, support the union uh, arguing that what what will kill independence really is uh, more devolution, mm. uh, and completely ignoring the fact that Alex Salmond. He's perfectly happy for that because he knows that it's just one more step towards independence. So I think actually if um, we talk about 2014 as a kind of big marker, I don't think it is. I think whether or not um, Salmon loses, if we yeah, carry we on the way we are, we Scotland will be independent uh, and the UK will be a completely different, uh, I mean at very least will be a completely different structure than what we have now and will not have that common purpose. And actually, I think that's been, that, that uh, lack of common purpose has actually been supported by people who claim to be unionists. I think you guys have been really good at setting out the kind of hollowness of the union nowadays, but um, I kind of want to uh, pose the flip side of that, and that's the sort of weird passivity of the pro-independence side. So Max mentioned Ireland, which I think is a good 
kind of counterexample. So you have the War of Independence in the 1920s coming out of the First World War, the Bolshevik Revolution. There's a large amount of activity going on. There are a lot of political ideas going around. Same for the Troubles in the 70s coming out of the 68 and all, all of that kind of uh, changes happening there. And both things were contested violently by people in Ireland and by the British state. You know, it's a big thing we're fighting over. You look at the Catalan nationalists nowadays who are obviously a sort of pale imitation maybe of back in the 30s in Spain possibly, but they managed to get a million people on the streets a few weeks ago. There is some actual dynamism going on, whereas the SNP does seem to be a kind of a bit of a, you know, kind of small politico type thing in comparison to those things. I just kind of wanted to throw that in there. Yes, I, I agree. I, uh, so I probably should declare an interest as a former MP and former MSP, but I agree with Joyce McMillan about the SNP that there have been a competent administration. And they've been a competent administration simply because they fielded their first 11 in the Scottish Parliament, whereas the other parties have basically fielded their third 11, not even their second 11. And they've been very capable in administration. Um, I think the problem that Salmon's got, and it's obviously the divisions within his own party between the fundamentalists and the graduates, but I think the problem he's got actually is actually in the, in the debate itself. And of course, as a former supporter of the Euro, I will cover, uh, uh, pass quickly over his experience as an economist of the Royal Bank of Scotland, but uh, <laughs> as a former supporter of the Euro, he now is in favour of the pound. Now, of course, this is the real major, this could become a very major issue in the, in the debate. I don't think it's that technical. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, he says, well, we'd like a, a place on the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England. Well, it's up to the Bank of England and the British government to decide. And I think that the main person leading the uh, no debate or the keep the union, keep uh, the United Kingdom debate will be Alistair Darling, and I think he's a, he's a formidable debater. He, I think he's forensically uh, very capable of taking apart the economic arguments that Sam makes. And the point is, what is independence if basically your 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 interest rate is being set by the Bank of England? I mean, that's the that's the main problem that I think he's really got, and he hasn't answered it yet. He's fluffed it, and it's the main. I think it's going to come down to that central issue. It's a very important issue. It's, it's very easy for people to understand, and I think he's going to lose it. And one of the interesting things, I mean, I lived in Wales for about five years, and what I found very interesting about living there was that there was a real sense of um, anti-establishment, anti-Westminster feeling amongst people there, and I'm, I haven't lived in Scotland, but I suspect there's probably a similar thing. Now, the SNP taps into a rich vein of that, I think, and one of the, the ironies is the closer we get through to this vote, the more Salmon is going to, and the SNP are going to feel the need to play the mainstream cards to make sure people aren't actually frightened by independence. We see this with the pound example that, we, that the gentleman has just talked about. What you see is the SNP actually increasingly converging on the mainstream of policy, and ironically, that's the thing that's pissing most people off about most mainstream parties. Yeah. And the more that happens, I think, the less likely independence will become. Also, just very quickly, um, I'm interested in this idea of so this, this national purpose argument. Mm -hmm. I'm not a very ardent nationalist. I'm sort of, uh, as a fairly sort of liberal person, I'm actually what I'm more interested in the civic side of things. So uh, whilst we've sort of dismissed the minutiae of decision making and exactly how it's happening and that kind of thing. Actually, for me, that's far more important for me than how my state is run than any sense of nationalism. I find myself in a strange position of never being a nationalist or unionist and uh, I suddenly find myself on the side where I end up apparently being both of those yeah, things. Exactly. Very, very strange times we live in. Given that the whole of the Lockerbie experience has produced both the, 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 the Crown, the Scottish political system, um, the courts and the police in Scotland, how can we repair all these institutions when in, if in, independence takes place? Because the man who was put into jail was certainly not guilty. The gentleman at the back there, uh, very interesting uh, on uh, Salmon's adoption of the pound. And I think for me, what's, what is interesting how, when I think about these things, I, I would feel much more comfortable uh, with independence if it was uh, properly independent. For me, that's one of the things that I find so uh, disheartening about this whole thing is that uh, it doesn't seem to have, actually, and uh, we were talking earlier about SNP's uh, common purpose, but even that is bec uh, becoming watered down to the extent that, you know, we'll, we'll keep the Queen, we'll keep uh, the, the, the uh, NHS, we'll keep the BBC, we'll keep the Pound. What, what's the difference? It's just kind of change the labels. And, uh, and what, what independence actually turns into is actually more like, kind of, uh, like a localist movement. For me, that's... that's uh, 
well, you know, you can you can fight for that if you want, but just admit that's what you actually want. Uh, mm. uh, it's it's not an independent Scotland at all. It's uh, just a bit more control for you uh, and your bodies, really. Now, Alex Salmon thinks wrongly that if he strikes a positive note and they carry on being so negative, then then he's likely to win. That's not the case particularly in times of economic stringency. People will tend to vote out of fear rather than out of hope. But the point is, we wake up on the morning after the referendum. Alex Salmond has lost the vote by a margin of, say, I don't know, um, 55 to 45, or, or 55 to 35 even. No one has a positive project for Scotland of any sort. Um, Alex Salmond's project has been torn to, part, uh, to, to pieces by a concerted attack by the unionists. I mean, what are we saying here? What do we really want in our politics? And that's one of the problems that I'm facing as a commentator and as a voter, yeah. that if no one is offering anything except a lot of snidey, nitpicking arguments about why Scotland can or shouldn't be an independent country, then you know, I'm not going to be very cheery either way on the morning after the referendum. There's lots of other things I could say, particularly on the EU issue, by the way. Please Please warn your friends in your Tory, the Tory party not to do that. To well, think the Conservative Party just once, Joyce. Yes, I, okay. I want to hear you say it. I have, I have I done hear actually you. once or twice in, in the course playing. of this I'm discussion. You're, you're, please tell them not to think that, that, that Britain coming out of the EU will help. It, it, you know, 20 years down the road, yeah. it possibly might. Yeah. But at the moment, at, at the visceral, emotional level, Scots like the EU at least as much as they mm. like Westminster. Mm. Um, you know, they like the feeling of being in a European community. They like other European countries. They do not share the attitude that we understand how to run things and, and, and jolly foreigner doesn't. Um, so, you know, the whole thing is, is, is that... that, that that, 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 that it's absolutely important to respect the European sentiments of the Scots, whatever institutional form that mm. takes at a time of crisis just for the European I Union. Bring Max in. Uh, yeah, sorry, in yeah, so just on the, uh, the uh, uh, darling question, I, mean, I kind yeah. of think if, if we do leave uh, 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 the, arg the argument for the UK to people like Alistair Darling and uh, Gordon Brown and a few other names, uh, the UK is fucked. I mean, like these are the, these are the exact people. These are the exact people um, oh, the, S right. the, SM the SNP wants to uh, uh, point yeah. out. We want uh, the, the Scotch people want to get away from the idea that we'd leave it to them. I think for me, if we are going to try and make a positive case for the union, uh, and it's uh, maybe social and political arguments, it needs to come from people who um, aren't uh, the mainstream politicians that people hope to get away from in the first place. And in terms of the EU sentiment, I think. Uh, I don't quite agree with Joyce. I, I think it's perfectly possible to be anti-EU whilst still being pro-European. And actually, mm -hmm. and, and I think uh, what's interesting is that the uh, SNP seem to try and spin the UK's desire to kind of extract itself from the EU as very negative, while ignoring the idea that actually it's, it's a desire for uh, sovereignty, um, perhaps the same as the, the Scots. No, I think that's right, and I think it's interesting. I mean, Joyce, you kind of said that you contrasted attitudes in England where we don't want to be run by Johnny Foreigner with attitudes in Scotland where they don't mind being run by Johnny Foreigner, and it appears to no, me no, that the argument is so long as Johnny Foreigner isn't English. Yes, um, well, there is well, an element of well, that. Well, in that, that case, in that case we really are doomed, yeah. So if, if it's really the case that there are vast swathes of the Scottish electorate sitting there thinking they desperately want their country to be run by Herman von Rompuy, but they cannot possibly bear a country that is run by no, that, I think uh, David Cameron. Then that's, then that's, the then that's, then that's the argument. No, mean, I'm just saying it's a bit more equal in Scotland maybe yeah. than it is in England. No, no, sure. That, that and, people, people see the, the sure. bureaucrats of the EU and the bureaucrats of Westminster, they don't feel a great sense of allegiance to either of them, no. but they don't necessarily assume that one is worse than the other. Which is fair enough, and I don't for a second think that if we were to suddenly and dramatically tomorrow yeah. morning leave the European Union, that that would uh, be the thing that one as the Scottish independence referendum. What I am trying to suggest, however, is that our participation in the European Union has provided an avenue for, be it Plaid Cymru, be it the SNP, you know, when you've already stripped out the sovereignty and the purpose of the Westminster government at one level, it makes it a lot easier to justify stripping it out at another. And you're also offered the protection, I think the illusory protection, but the protection yeah. of joining a massive supranational yeah. body. I, I do think that, I mean, there, there is a possibility of offering kind of common national purpose. And it almost pains me to say it because it's not something that I necessarily find uh, that appealing in and of itself. But Josh, you talked about the incredible resources that Scotland has in terms of green energy. In terms now, in, in order to develop the Scottish economy to its fullest possible potential, in order to use those resources to their fullest possible potential, in order to rejuvenate and revive the kind of fortunes that meant people build massive houses on boulevards in Glasgow that, uh, that, that are resplendent and magnificent, I would make the case that that doesn't just require uh, political sovereignty 
Uh, it requires uh, cooperation and economic and political mm. engagement. Investment. And investment, indeed. Investment that it's going to be harder to come by. Now, I know that sounds like a purely economic case, but I think there is a political dimension here. Well, it's also a bit tricky. Why would can... it be harder to come by? Some people in America, for instance, like the idea of an independent Scotland and are campaigning vigorously for it, even though they're rich. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I, I can explain to you why it'll be harder to come by. No. It'll be harder to come by because the Scottish economy, in terms of the amount that you're able to raise, the amount that you're oh, able to... Here we go. Well, no, no, no. I mean, sorry, it is just a reality that countries that don't have as much resource in terms of money, in terms of workforce, in terms of skills, frankly, and also in terms of your ability to run a balanced budget uh, outside of the, U of the United Kingdom, those countries find it really hard, especially at the moment, to leverage in the kind of money that you're going to need to produce this utopia. Thanks. Um, it does seem striking to me that we can be discussing nationalism at a time when nationalism is at such a low ebb. Um, I think the point at the back actually raised a very interesting issue about the fact that this is a discussion about independence taking place completely apart from the people uh, whom it affects. And so you have to start to wonder what, and I'm trying to answer that question as to why this issue has, been, has come up now. And it certainly seems like a discussion which is taking place on the terms provided by um, the political elites both in Scotland and in England. You saw that over the discussion, the quibbling over the terms of the referendum that was going to be put to the Scottish people. And it does seem that this issue, of course that wouldn't necessarily be necessary if there was a clear idea about what independence would mean. But at, in, at a time when confidence or a, a, a coherent idea, not just about what S Scottish nationalism amounts to, but also what UK nationalism amounts to. My question is, well, is this, question, is this issue of nationalism rising simply as a result of uh, the political elite rather than anything coming from uh, the people uh, of Scotland and England? And if so, I think that explains some of the uh, ambivalence about asking this question in the first place. It strikes me, I lived in Edinburgh for nearly 10 years, and it strikes me that actually Scotland isn't really a nation anymore, and it hasn't been for quite a long time. It, I think it was in 1992 when he lost his seat, Jim Sillers, the uh, ex-SNP politician, you know, bemoaned the Scots as 90-minute patriots. Um, and I think it's probably a 90-minute nation, really, in the sense that, you know, apart from having you know, a separate football team, um, then you know, there isn't a lot to distinguish. Well, that's hardly an advantage given the way it's played. Well, it's, 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 it's quite a great <laughs> distinction between, between people living in England and Wales and Scotland, except in Edinburgh where it's an 80 minute nation, obviously, because they're all rugby fans. Uh, the, um, so, uh, and the, uh, when I went, went up there, there was a programme on, on STV called Speaking Our Language. And somebody pointed out to me, you don't need a TV programme called Speaking Our Language if it is your language. Mm. And in reality, you know, while you know, a few people up north speak Gaelic and a very even smaller number down south speak a bit of Scots, <laughs> actually most people in, in Scotland speak English, have common currency, have, they have the same tastes. You know, there is a very, very clear common culture between England, Scotland and Wales um, uh, that, that's built up over 300 years. Uh, and actually what makes Scotland in any way distinct isn't actually that distinct from sort of the uh, sort of anti-London chippiness of Newcastle or Liverpool or anywhere else. So, that, you know, so is, there, is there a nation that it, it really there in Scotland to decide its future, to, to self-determine? Or is it in fact that, that as the, the rea reality of a nation long since passed? What I would like to address is the, the, the point of, of national parties. Um, we discussed, well, it's, it's good to have union parties. I would like to go a step further. I would like to go to see uh, European parties. I would like to see an LD competing in, in national or local elections. I would like to see a Green, uh, Greens party compete in, in national and local elections and a European Labour party. So I would like to go, go to a European level on, 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 on that respect. Um, the third you mean European-wide political parties? Yeah. Is that what you're yes, talking about? Yes, European political parties. And that sort of, you know, join elections on every <laughs> level, both on the European Parliament level and on local election levels, mm -hmm. maybe in parish counties. Um, but what I think is really important when we're discussing a referendum is that the Scottish people actually have a choice. And it's not between voting between independence and not independence, but they have a range of choices. And I think that that is exactly what, what Westminster is trying to do at the moment, 
is limiting the choice for the Scots. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is, is basically a dirty trick for that point. Just, I, I feel that you're almost right in your point that it's, it's anybody but the English, you know, that a lot of people, that's the reason that they vote for the SNP. Liberals, Labour, they're, they're all, they all have the title Scottish in front of them to distinguish them from the Labour Party or the Conservative Party, but they're all seen as an offshoot of an English party, whereas the SNP are seen as being for Scotland, party of Scotland yeah. and that's what they're for. Uh, I did have a, a, a question in that, given that 58% of people in the last poll are against the union, and given that we're not exactly sure what the union's for, how many people do you think will actually turn out and vote in yeah. a referendum yeah. Yeah. for yeah, something that we're not sure yeah, we're voting sure. for? My question is, I'm not sure that it's necessarily based entirely on the nationalism that we're talking about. If you don't have nationalism, then what you have left is individualism. And I understand, uh, this is out of date statistics, but about six months ago, 20% of the, uh, the Scottish people who wouldn't have associated themselves with wanting independence, but would have voted for independence if, if, the, if their pocket would benefit by more than £400. Um, now, that's not, that's not a huge chunk, but they're clearly uh, motivated entirely by individualism and not by nationalism. Uh, and I what does that mean for, for the whole notion of Scottish independence? The most crucial point was raised over here by um, a man who I otherwise disagree with, I think. I, I am genuinely very worried um, about turnout. I mean, I think the, the proposed referendum electorate is big enough, as I've already made clear, because I think we should all have a say in it. But in the terms in which it's being conducted, I, I think there is a question about to what extent people on either side who have mild feelings about it are going to come out and, and feel like they're having their say. I don't, however, I mean, th this idea that, you, that, that, oh, the referendum is limiting choice. Uh, referendums are about limiting choice. It's about giving people a set of uh, ideas that are mutually contradictory and saying, look, you've got to choose one. It is an abdication of the responsibility of politicians. I think it's a, a pretty appalling thing to do in general. Um, on this particular issue, I mean, how many choices do you want to give them? I mean, what is it that you want... It is mutually contradictory to be independent and still be in the United Kingdom. So there's are two completely different options about which there is absolutely no way that you can compromise. It is perfectly straightforward that if you're going to have a referendum, you should ask people to decide between two uh, perspective things. And my final kind of thought on this is the point about nationalism or individualism. I think to some extent you've, you've kind of hit the nail on the head and you're right, because not just, I mean, it's a, it is, it is a, a damning fact, this, this thing, the poll that was conducted, and, and, you know, £400 to give up your country is an extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary position to be in. But it speaks to the, the, the wider disillusionment, right? We've talked a lot about Scotland. We've talked a lot about how Scottish people think and feel. I'm at a disadvantage in that conversation because I can't uh, <laughs> pretend to be one. But actually, it's, it's not the case either that everyone sat around in England is sat here going... I love my country and I think that we are uh, on the right direction and I feel an obligation and I feel solidarity and I feel that I am connected to those people who share it with me. Uh, and that's really problematic. You know, and for all of me banging on about why I think I should be allowed to say, I have absolutely no confidence whatsoever that it would affect the result in the way that I would want it to affect it. Because I think there is a huge amount of, a kind of collective apathy about the notion of nation. And that is, that is a problem. And it is part of why political parties um, talk about localism to the extent that they do. And they talk about devolving power down. And sometimes that's a perfectly reasonable thing to talk about. But what we're really saying here, we're saying that we no longer feel able to empathise beyond the village that I happen to live in or the town that I happen to live in. And I agree with Craig's point that all this is really is a kind of hyper-localism. I've singularly failed to give any positive reason why the United Kingdom that I care reasonably passionately about and I'm a nationalist for, um, why we all ought to give that a big hug and keep it. And that's not just my failure, though. I'd like to point that out. It's a collective failure on the part of, uh, of our, those of us who claim to believe in it. And it's something that is, is hugely problematic. And we haven't got very much time left uh, to convince people of it.
We will just have to promise them £500 instead and hope we can buy them off <laughs> no. and get to a point so at some imaginary point in the future we can think about it. But we do need to be thinking about it. And those of us who, only one gentleman put his hand out, you know, the, anyone but the English. I mean, that's, uh, we, we call that racism. But most people in this audience didn't put their hands up and say they agreed with Scottish independence. So it's incumbent upon us to try and think of some reasons why. The fact that there's no popular movement like the huge demonstrations recently in Catalonia, that is true. There, but there is quite a high level of popular awareness. And what is true is that although the SNP is not mobilising people in millions, there aren't, you know, but, 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 but it, it is still much more mobilised than the other political parties are. And that's a, a key question. The trade union movement is still quite strong in Scotland, but it's very divided on this now. It's uh, partly still kind of old Labour, partly uh, moving towards a more nationalist position. Um, um, secondly, this idea that Scotland isn't a nation, it's at least as much a nation as the UK is, and, 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 and it does have a distinctive history, a distinctive culture. Uh, Edinburgh is, is a kind of a special case. Uh, really, as soon as you... I mean, I travel around Scotland all the time working as a theatre critic, and it really is as much a nation as any other uh, modern European nation, I would say. Yes, it shares a language, uh, fortunately, really, um, um, with, with the rest of the UK um, and doesn't have the same even language issues that they have in Wales, where there's a third of the population still do really speak Welsh. There's, there's nothing like that in Scotland. But that doesn't mean it's not a nation. Modern nationhood is a more subtle thing than that, and there, there are huge cultural and institutional differences, which traditionally have been well-respected in the Union, and that's not a consequence of devolution. Devolution was just a, a kind of final expression of that. Yeah, the, those, you know, the act of union itself in shrined a recognition of Scotland's separate nation with separate institutions. So um, that's not new, and there is a nation there. Don't, don't fall into the trap of thinking that there isn't. But I think at the core of all this lies a kind of um, question about the nature of national sovereignty in the modern world. I mean, we see that most starkly in relation to the EU, obviously, how much sovereignty have Ireland or Greece had um, um, in the last few years um, as part of the EU. But that's not just entirely the fault of the EU. It's also to do with the intense inter interdependence of modern economies and the fact that even quite big economies like the British one are, are by no means immune uh, to, to influences um, from, from the rest of the world economy. So, so, and, and, of course, economy is extremely important in sovereignty. It, it, it's a more powerful position to be an economically successful region, for instance, in a big European country than to be a completely impoverished country like Greece. So it's, it's, um, modern sovereignty is a very subtle and nuanced thing. And there's, you, know, you can't just say you know, the Scots would have no meaningful national sovereignty if they kept the pound. Not true. Ireland kept the pound for, what, half a century? Um, after it became an independent country, nobody said it. It, it was a bit of a, a nuisance, maybe, um, keeping, keeping you know, something that was linked to the pound. But nobody said it wasn't an independent country because of that. There are precedents for a lot of these complex relationships. There are precedents, particularly in, in Britain's continuing Final relationship with Ireland. Um, Finally, on the, I, could, I could talk at length about the range of choices, but fundamentally it's not the UK government's fault that that range of choices is, is not there. It's the fault of the unionist parties in Scotland, all three of them, which say they are in favour of, a, of, a, of enhanced devolution as an alternative to independence, but because they want to humiliate Alex Salmond in the referendum, have absolutely refused to put a plan for it on the table, thereby increasing the chances that Alex might in the end win the, the thing. Finally, the project for the UK, if I could just say one That's sentence okay, about yeah. that. I really did have a project for the UK at the time when I was campaigning for Scottish, and a lot of people in Scotland felt the same, for Scottish devolution in the 1990s. We felt that with the coming of a government that was willing to implement that, and Craig can, can laugh, but he's the generation that, that you know, um, um, have inherited this, but, 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 but the idea was to have a new UK which at the democratic level, as well as all the other levels, recognised that it was a multinational state. And it did work extremely well for the first decade of that plan. Um, what, what, what began to go wrong, of course, was the shifting tides of politics, uh, the, the kind of failure of the Blairite governments, the growing disillusion of them with them in Scotland, which propelled the SNP okay. really into power. And that has changed the landscape, having a majority SNP government. But there was a plan for a diverse, exciting, multicultural, open-minded and multinational UK. And if the Blair government had done it right, it could have succeeded. I disagree with about the uh, unionist parties in Scotland uh, being the cause of that uh, no um, devil max on the referendum. The failure there is actually that uh, people of Scotland, despite the fact when you ask them, do you want to, they go, well, yeah, uh, don't actually care all that much to campaign for it. Alex Salmond, when he came to the table uh, to discuss this, needed the support of Civic Scotland, Political Scotland, uh, for him to be able to ask for that. 
because he couldn't do it himself. He's in the, uh, looking, asking for things like that looks like failure. Well, it's not his fault. No, it's yeah, not. no. So I mean, but, but the thing is, the point is, I think this is the same reason, you know, like uh, uh, suggestion there uh, from from my dad actually, um, who said, you <laughs> know, want people, people won't people <laughs> won't turn out. People are not, despite everything, and a bit keen on it. It's really a kind of minority uh, interest na uh, nationalism. Um, why now then? I think like so. I mean, why now is because the failure of the mainstream pa parties. There wasn't real no no real choice uh, uh, of saying no to this referendum. Alex Salmon won a majority in Scotland, and part uh, part of his uh, stuff was to get a referendum on independence. And despite the fact the majority of people who supported him don't actually want independence, they still wanted. SNP in power, and mm. therefore there was no there was no kind of choice about it. Mm. So this is the kind of things that you know people are not all that keen on nationalism, um, but we're kind of sleepwalking into uh, the breakup of the UK. So can we have a huge round of applause for our speakers? <laughs>